Hello, and welcome to the BYU Library Family History Webinar. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on November 10th with Olivia Jewell. She will be giving a presentation entitled Essential Tools for the Hobbyist Genealogist. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation on how do you find genealogical records? Before we begin, here is a little bit about James. James has over 40 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog. He has served as a family history volunteer for 18 years and has presented at expos and conferences around the US, Canada, and Europe. He is a member of the board of directors of the Family History Guide Association and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James is a professional photographer and has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. And we will now turn the time over to James. Today, we're going to talk about how do you find genealogical records? This is actually going to involve quite a bit of, of uh, different types of things that we need to know about doing genealogy. And we'll get moving here. So the basic principle of how we get into genealogy from the very, very beginning is that genealogically valuable records are created, stored, and preserved geographically. That means what it says. It means location is important, and that location is really important, and location is really, really important. Uh, when we don't know a location, we cannot tell where our, if, if, when we say location, we mean, I mean a location in an event in your ancestor's life. And if you don't know the exact location of at least one event in an ancestor's life, you have no starting point. You have no place that you can begin to look for records for that individual. And so one of the other basic rules of genealogy is that we move from the known to the unknown. So if we were going to start at ground zero on uh, genealogical research, we would start with ourselves. Uh, if we don't know where we're born, we at least know where we're living right now. That would be uh, you know, something that we would be aware of. And if we know exactly where an event occurs in our own lives, then we have a point to start looking for records, even if it's records about ourselves. And that comes sometimes when we have people who uh, are foundlings or who are um, adopted or have no idea who their actual birth parents are for whatever number of reasons out there. But that's, that's relatively rare. It does happen, and it's something that we have to deal with on occasion, but what we're really talking about is once we have that beginning point. So for example, if I know that I was born in Utah, then I know I can start looking for records in Utah about my life. And I know one other fact, I know that when the baby was born, when I was born, the mother was there. That meant my mother was here in Utah when I was born. And so that starts the, the ball rolling. And then the next step in that is to begin to understand what records exist so that you can make some progress. You've got to know that, uh, uh, well, how, what kinds of things you would look for in order to find, for example, a birth record. And now if you have your own birth certificate, for example, then that gives you a little bit of more information. It may give you the name of the hospital or the doctor. It may give you your parents' names. It may have other information on the birth certificate that then takes you back one generation back to your parents. And this is the process of genealogy, finding a record 
uh, identifying a, a location in the, in the ancestor's life, finding the record, discovering that record, uh, finding or becoming aware of a record, finding and accessing the record. So before you begin looking, uh, you really need to have uh, know what you're looking for. And, and so it's important to understand in genealogy that we're looking for records. And what do we mean by a record? We, a record is some uh, written document, uh, it could be now online, obviously, uh, that uh, contains information that was collected at or near the time that an event occurred in an ancestor's life, and that it was reported by someone who was there and observed the event, or had some kind of a duty to report that event. So now we have a basis for saying, well, okay, where are all of these documents? Where do they come from? How do we go about finding them? And that's really the idea here of this uh, presentation is to talk about the process of finding those documents. So now we're gonna look at some very basic uh, help online helps, things that can help you directly and some books and things that are important. But one number one thing I would start with is what's called the Family Search Research Wiki. And this is on familysearch.org, the website. It's under the search menu and it's called the Research Wiki. And it has over 100,000 articles on every country in the world, literally. And it shows what records are available and gives you some idea of whether or not where those records can be uh, obtained, either online or whether you have to go to an archive, whether you have to go actually go to the country. And so this is this is a go-to place. This is where you go to start it out getting information. I had someone come into the Family History Library in the last week and ask to look at um, records from the De Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, I knew that this person was coming in and I went to the research wiki and that gave me a head start in looking and finding out where these records might be available. And I found there were millions of records from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So it was not something that I could just sit there and say, well, I really don't know what to do to help you. But actually what happened is that uh, we spent a good hour and uh, the person was just totally amazed at the number of records that were available for, uh, for her to look at. The second place I would suggest is, is a little more organized, a little more, is a little simpler to get into, and it's, it's more direct, and that's the Family History Guide or the fhguide.com. Now, the Family History Guide will, will take you step by step through any process. So if you click on one of those countries up there in the world, then you'll have it if specific instructions on where the records are kept and how to, how to go about accessing those records. The records are not on the Family History Guide. They are linked. You're linked out to, to videos and help that will tell you how or where you can, you can obtain those records. So this is, uh, uh, this is like the, the, a little bit more a little different approach to the Family Research Wiki, which is a wiki and which has all these different articles in it, but this is more organized and step-by-step. -step. So you have two ways to go into uh, obtaining information about the where to, where to start looking for documents. The next thing I would suggest is the FamilySearch.org research catalog or the catalog. The catalog is organized, as I mentioned right at the beginning, by location. It's ge geographically located. You search by places. And when you search by a place, such as the United States, you get a long list of all the different categories of records that are available at the through the Family History Life um, website. It's a family search website. When I say that, I, I get to understand that the records that we use here at the family on family search are records that are in the family history library in salt lake city utah so these are all records from the family history library in salt lake city that's why it's uh, the largest family history library in the world 
So places within the United States, for example, if we clicked on that, we would come up with all of the individual states. So there would be records for each state, uh, for records for all the counties in the United States, records for all, all the major cities in the United States. So that's another way. This is called rootsweb.com, and it's the rootsweb wiki. So wiki.rootsweb.com. The reason why I bring this up is because there are two books that have been updated and they are available on here. And these are fundamental books for understanding American US gene genealogy. And this is a timeless source. Um, sometimes we get a little bit confused when, we, when we're working with, um, with genealogical research because it's historical research. And we think, well, we need the latest we need the newest records and the newest books. And the answer is no, we don't need the latest records and the newest books, they are, they're helpful. But what we need is the old stuff. And these books like the source and the red book never go out of business. I mean, they're just there. They are as applicable today as on the day they were published. They may not contain all the latest online information, for example, but they will contain uh, the basic concepts in the background to genealogy. And that's basically what we're looking for. The source is a general book and it talks and describes all the different kinds of records that can exist. And those records haven't changed. They're still out there and they're still the kinds of records that we need to use. And the Red Book talks about American state, county and tour towns resources. These, It's also a good reference for the kinds of records and where they might be located. Although, unless it's been updated constantly, uh, the addresses, telephone numbers, things like that, that might be in this book might be out of date. But then we go back to the uh, internet and look up the information. It may be just the same, or it may be of newer information from that particular uh, county or, or, um, in the, or town in the United States. But these kinds of things are extremely valuable. Now, this is the uh, researcher's guide to American genealogy. And as I go back in my years of doing genealogy, uh, I would call it the pivotal point in learning about what I was really trying to do, which basically I'd been sort of going on instinct as to uh, I need to look at records, I need to find out who my family is and that kind of thing. And I'd begun gathering family group records and, and uh, talking to people and getting what I could have could obtain about my family. But when I read this book, The Researcher's Guide to American Genealogy, it basically gave me a fundamental concept and, under, and I understood, oh, wow, this is what I'm really trying to do as a genealogist. I'm going to go out and find these records. And I, that became the, began the process with me long before there was an internet, when there were just barely really uh, computers being introduced, uh, desktop computers introduced that we could use in the, at home. And yet I now knew what I was looking for and how to go about finding uh, a great deal of records. And, and I understood immediately that this would apply to every other country in the world. In other words, there was no, fundamental difference between record keeping in any society in any country and any culture that was out there. That uh, all we had to know is there had to be some records and there were probably records in these various categories. And this gave me the leg up into getting into genealogical research. Of course, that was just the beginning and it took many, many years for me to really understand uh, the entire scope of, of how that occurred. I also spent a considerable amount of time taking classes from Brigham Young University on the independent study program so that I could further understand how to do genealogy like it, you know, it should be done. So the concept here is to start small and learn as you go. Um, there are out there in the world, there are uh, uh, activities, there are um, learned classes, there are all sorts of things, and we'll talk about a few of those today. But uh, what happens is that you have to take the effort to, to learn about these things as you go. 
you can't just believe that somehow you know how to do this because it seems obvious that you're you're going to get this information. Uh, it's a fairly complex subject and it involves a lot of different factors. Genealogy will call upon your your knowledge of history. It will call upon your knowledge of geography. Obviously, it will call upon your ability to read the records, uh, to research those records, extract information from the records. Uh, it will also uh, be involved in how to uh, read different languages, different handwritings. There's lots of fun fundamental things that go on with genealogy, all of which take time and effort to learn. Uh, and those of us who spend that time and learn are able to uh, benefit from being able to find our ancestors and, and find more information and also assist other people. So this is kind of the, the process. But if you work through those three books, for example, the source and the red book and um, the, the American Genealogy book by Greenberg. If you work through those three books and really study the three the websites, if you study the uh, the wiki and the uh, family history guide and the catalog and family search, which has the research wiki and the catalog, then you really have a um, you will really have a basis. And I can clearly say this: you'll know more than almost all the genealogists in the United States. So there's just there's just so much information there that uh, will help you and and help you to be focused in on all of the all of the different uh, places and times there are. Now, most genealogists, when they begin to work through the beginning part of being a genealogist, start to to focus on a certain line in their their ancestry, or a certain type of records in their ancestry, and and most of the professional genealogists and the ones who are uh, have advanced studies in genealogy, for example, but will focus on a geographic area. In other words, uh, you can't know everything about everything. And so a lot of people uh, will look and they'll become an expert in English records or German records or Scandinavian records or some other place. Um, and so when you have that kind of, and those are the kinds of people that you can use to help because they've spent the time to be able to understand more in depth than, than uh, those of us who have not focused intensely on one area of, uh, of study. And I need to remember to remind everyone that, by the way, this, this uh, webinar and all of the other webinars are on the BYU Family History Library uh, YouTube channel. And we have over 700 videos, and the number is going up at about three or four a week. And we have um, on every conceivable subject. So if you if you learn better by watching and hearing, uh, then these videos are extremely valuable. Uh, for me, it's a combination of reading, wa uh, watching, and hearing, because I I use I learn more visually than I do um, by simply. Uh, hearing something or by reading it, I have to see something, how it works a little bit. And once I've seen that, then all of a sudden I can understand both the, the reading and the um, the part about and any other parts of the of the education process. So another possibility, if this is all just over the top and you can't you just can't understand how you would ever get started, I would suggest you would go out and uh, find a family history center or library near you and sit down with some people and maybe take a class, uh, maybe uh, talk to somebody to give you to show you how to do it, and get into your program and get started uh, doing some research and, and understanding where all this happens. Sometimes if you sit down with somebody and you have somebody ask questions to that, it just clarifies everything. And you can just get ahead, go ahead and, and find. Now, this map is the Find a Family History Center map. It's on Family Search. It's a little bit obscure. So what you how you get to it is you put in Find a Family History Center in Google, and then it'll usually, you know, it'll take you to this map. And this is a zoom-in map. So as you zoom in, you'll be able to see the location and the identity of all of the over 5,000 
family history centers and libraries that there are in the um, in the Family Search affiliates, all of these different libraries, and this is invaluable. And uh, in some cases, uh, the records on Family Search are only available in family history centers. So that if you need to look at certain records that turn up to be turn out to be restricted, that you may by necessity have to go to a family history center to, uh, to access those records. And it's, uh, you know, there, there are all sorts of them. Some of them are very small uh, operations with maybe a one or two computers. And some of them are very elaborate like the family history library at BYU, which is the second largest family history library in the world. So uh, some of them have uh, dozens. Uh, we have over a hundred uh, volunteer missionaries and so does the Family History Library in Salt Lake. But we, but other these centers may have only a very small staff and they may be there for only a certain period of time. And this will usually give you their hours, but it's always a good idea to call ahead and see if there's uh, going to be somebody there when you need to be there. This is kind of a fundamental. The, the, you understand that um, there's been a transition over the past few years from having paper records to having digitized records online. And the big, the large websites like Family Search and Ancestry and Find My Past and My Heritage and Filet and, and Jenny, Jenny Nett and all these other, uh, there's other ones in other countries around the world that are very large genealogically um, records, including archives and, and uh, libraries. I understand that there's been just a billions of these records out there. Billions of genealogical records have been digitized and made available online. But they don't help you if you don't know they exist. Now, one of the most common things that I run into is that people will start with family search and they'll say, and they'll be working with family search and I'll say, well, okay, well, have you uh, tried ancestry? Oh, well, I looked at it, but I really don't uh, know how to use it, and I don't know what the records are. Well, uh, don't they just have the same records as uh, Family Search? No, each of the websites has their own unique connection collections, uh, and archives may have records that that none of the online genealogical re uh, websites have. And the numbers of these are increasing uh, just phenomenally every day. Uh, you can uh, the, the numbers that come in each week from the various websites of the numbers of records added is into the hundreds of thousands and millions of records being being added by all these different websites every single day of the year. And the only way you're going to know that is if you take time to understand and look and see about how these exist. One of the helps on family search is that for each individual, there's a link out to do searches in the major websites, including Google. So you can simply do your website search right there out of familysearch.org and uh, find additional information about your, your ancestors. Now, it, it become obvious if, they, if the records you know, are out there, but you still can't find them or don't know that they exist, then that's the major operation that we have. That is the major activity of a genealogist is to locate and uh, access those records. So what I'd suggest, um, if you don't know that they exist and then you don't know where they are located and then how to access them, then they're just useless. So, uh, that's not another part. This is the major activity right here of being of being a gene genealogist is identifying or understanding what records there are, then understanding where they're located, either online or still in paper, or and then understanding how to access them. So this is a simple example. If, for example, for you may find out that there are records in the National Archives of the United States or in the National Archives in Great Britain or any other National Archives. But if you don't know how to get into the National Archives to find the records, then they don't help you. 
you can't uh, you, you're not going to ever find that information if if that's where it is and you can't access it or don't know how to access it so that's another part of the learning process that you do now a couple of years ago we spent uh, my wife and i spent some time digitizing records for family search we were located in annapolis maryland and we had the opportunity to go down to the national archives and to the library of congress and we learned very quickly that in neither of those two large repositories was it possible to walk in the door and actually look at records uh, you had to go through a, a process of applying for readers cards or access cards in both locations and that was a process and then once you got to that point you still know know, know where the records were, were and how they existed and in both cases you couldn't go in and look at the records without spending some time uh, beforehand, either ordering rare records that and, and looking for what you needed and then saying, and then they would say, well, like at the Library of Congress, they would say, well, yeah, we can get those for you there on our uh, external uh, uh, warehouse. And so we, it will take you two or three days to get those records. So depending on, the, this is just an example of the kinds of things that you would might want to know now if you think uh, oh these records are in the library of congress and you just jump on a plane and you say well i'll just go and ask about these records well you may find out like we did after we had been to the library of congress a number of times that we were not going to be able to um we were not going to be able to access those records immediately and uh, and so the utility of the of having all those millions of records in the in in both locations in the in the archives national archives and library of congress is is something you only are going to be able to get if you know that in advance and go there and spend your you know a, a week or two or more uh, learning and uh, getting access to the records and this is kind of a microcosm of of the the whole process we go through. Another thing you that that comes up constantly is that many of the large websites like Ancestry, MyHeritage, and, and Find My Past are pay uh, are subscription sites, and so uh, either you can access them at a family history center for free, or you may have to um, basically um, uh, wait until you can afford to get on those websites. And so there's there's a lot of steps involved in all of this process. And, and my kind of analogy here is that you can have a whole kitchen full, full of utensils and food, and it doesn't help you if you don't know how to cook. Now, my wife is, is a wonderful cook, and I uh, do, I can boil water, I can fry eggs, and I can eat cold cereal. But if I went too far beyond that, I would be starting at ground zero. I am not uh, in any sense of the word a cook. And I can follow directions on the pa uh, package, but I'll tell you what, it may not ever turn out twice the same way when I do it. So this is the process that we're talking about. It's a process of, of going through certain steps uh, a lot of which takes a lot of practice and a, and a considerable amount of time in order for us to learn how the DAT to works. Now, the most expensive car in the world is just a pile of metal if you don't know how to drive. And that's kind of another analogy here, that when we're looking at a, um, when we're when we're actually in the process, we need to learn how to do it before we can get any benefits from it. And by the way, this is a Bugatti and it is the most expensive car in the world as far as we know right now. So, uh, it, but if, if you got in the car and you couldn't even uh, turn it on, it, would be, uh, it wouldn't be much use to you, even if you had the uh, more than a million dollars that you would have to spend on one of these cars. And here's here's the point. Learning under overcomes frustration. And I talk to a lot of frustrated uh, genealogists. I talk to people I, every every week. I talk to, to a number of people 
who have uh, are very frustrated because they're looking for one specific thing or they're looking to get started or they're looking for whatever it is and they just don't know what the process is. And that's the point of these webinars. That's the point of my teaching classes and my point of sitting down with people and helping them to do genealogy is to learn enough to overcome this frustration, this lack of, of well, where do I do next? How do I go about finding my great grandfather? I mean, he came from Scandinavia and how do I get even know about that? So uh, there is a process and that's the process of learning um, how to go back and do this sort of thing. And it's just like walking into this, uh, a large library like this, and that's something else you have to learn. So important to understand that they don't teach you genealogy in grammar school or high school. Um, it's something you have to learn on your own and to do it. Now, there are, um, as I started to mention a moment ago, there are universities and uh, other educational institutions that have structured courses. Uh, BYU Idaho, uh, Brigham Young University Idaho up in Rexburg has a, um, a basic classes in uh, genealogy and they take them online. Uh, they're distance learning classes and you can go through a formal training process and many people do. And then some of the people I know also go on and obtain advanced degrees in genealogy. There's a couple of colleges in Scotland that have uh, master's degrees programs for, um, for genealogy. So there is formal education out there, but it's, uh, it's very time consuming. And it, uh, but the benefits are very high, uh, particularly if you take uh, the online courses at, at Brigham Young University's uh, at BYU Idaho because that's there's also a degree in family history from Brigham Young University and that's a, a four year degree so you can come you can go into it at that level and, and learn what you need to know to to be a genealogist but like any four year degree uh, if once you get out into the real world and start practicing and looking and trying to learn things on your own you're going to find out there was a lot of stuff that wasn't covered in your uh, in your degree I went to law school for three years at Arizona State University, and uh, the first one of my first jobs that I got as a lawyer outside of the university was as a, a law clerk, uh, helping uh, kind of a gopher for the uh, for a law firm, and they sent me downtown to file a document. So they handed me a pile of documents. They said, "Take these down to the court and file them." And I said, okay, great, I'll do that, you know, kind of the eager thing, and ran downtown to file the documents with the court. And uh, I walked into the courthouse for the first time. I looked around. Well, I'd been there before, but I just, I hadn't a clue what I was supposed to do. And finally, I said to somebody, well, where do I go to file documents? And they said, see that window over there? Just go there and, and they'll help you. And so I went over to the window and she's, said, well, what do you want? I said, I need to file these documents. She says, well, hand them to me. So I gave her the document. She picked them up. She went stamp, 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 stamp with a date stamp on each one. And then she said, uh, okay. And I said, well, now what? She said, you just filed the documents. It was as simple as that. But even something as simple as filing a document after, of course, after 39 years of uh, practicing law, uh, filing a document was not even something I had to think about. It was just something I knew where every place to go to hand them the documents and what I had to do if I had to get something back or whatever. So uh, there's a process. There's always a process in life that we go through to learn whatever it is. If you learn, learn how to fish or if you want to learn how to read or whatever it is you're doing, you've got to go through that. And genealogy has the same level of, of uh, difficulty. So here's, here's an interesting one. If you, if you walk into a library, uh, you need to learn how to find the books in the library if you don't already know how. So uh, how do you go about learning this? Well, once again, there are degrees in library science. And, uh, uh, but at some point in your life, you have to go into a library and start learning how to find the books. 
And there are lots of different ways. There's lots of different classification systems out there. Um, lots of ways the information is organized. When I started, obviously, we had paper uh, library card catalogs with three by five cards with the library information on the three by five cards. And there was a number on that card. And when I was about eight years old and started going into libraries, I pretty quickly learned that that number told me where in the library the books were. And I had to wander around in the library until I spotted the number or asked somebody where the books were. And then I began to associate my numbers that I wanted to look at the book, the types of books I wanted to look at. And so I knew where the sections were. And if I saw a number that was my section, then I could knew where to go. Well, that's the same process. That's what we learn when we learn genealogy. We learn where to go and what to do and how to answer certain questions that come up. Like, where do I go to find a birth certificate? Well, that will vary in every country, in every jurisdiction, in every state, and it will and it will be different. And so it's just like going into a library. It may be different in this library. They are arranged differently. They're physically different. And we need to spend some time learning that kind of process. Uh, we're same problem with we have online. Um, most of us probably by now uh, can get onto our phone or get onto uh, a computer and find some basic information. So, for example, if you need to go to a store, you may be able to get onto the computer, type in the name of the store and find an address or a phone number and we can call that. Or if you need a doctor or a plumber or whatever that these are the kinds of things that we're that we learn to search online. But now when we're talking about uh, accessing historical records, we need a whole different level of being able to search online. Because if I came in to you and I said, uh, I need to find my grandfather, uh, and his name is Jose Gonzalez, and he lived in uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, then uh, what would we do to find that? Where would we go to find a record for that person? That's the that's the core concept of uh, of looking, and uh, we could start by looking up Guadalajara, Mexico, and see what kinds of and put the word in records, for example, and search to see what records might be available. And um, interestingly enough, if you do that little experiment, you'll find out that it'll take you to Family Search most of the time. Uh, and it might take you to ancestry, and it might take you to uh, my heritage. And it would depend on where you were looking and what kinds of records you were looking for. Uh, so these are the processes of, of learning that turn somebody who was like me many years ago, who knew absolutely nothing, uh, to, into somebody who had a, a background to answer some kinds of questions and be able to help other people with those questions. Now, even though I get um, this, this almost continually, uh, it's regularly someone will come up to me and start telling me that they have searched everywhere. I have this in the last two weeks. Um, someone uh, came into me with a very long question. I mean, it was probably three pages long. And it was a very, very complete description of all the places that these, uh, there were actually two people working together, uh, that where they'd looked and looked. And the question was, well, now we've looked everywhere, so where else is there to look? Well, within a very short time, we had uh, discussed the, what they had done and uh, had come up with a few more places that they could start to look. And and now it's, keeps, it's kind of rolling now that... Uh, uh, once we got through their concept that they'd looked everywhere, then we found out that there were a lot more records that they hadn't looked at yet. And it's it's very common uh, when I look and go through uh, uh, the number of what people are um, have looked at that they are they're kind of stuck in what I call the BMD group, the uh, birth, marriages, and deaths. And burials, that's another one, we'll call it BMB, BMDB. Um, 
but that basically there's four kinds of records are all that you find and then maybe some census records and you know usually i'll see census uh, some birth records and some marriage and maybe death records and burial records if they're available and, and, but that's just like saying i've looked everywhere when you walk into a uh, five and dime store and then you go to costco or you go to Walmart, or you get to Walmart online, or to cut, or to Amazon online, or whatever. Uh, looking everywhere does not include uh, the area, the records that you can find uh, quickly and immediately. There are lots of other records out there. We, if you go back to the beginning of this presentation, you'll uh, you remember that I took you to the research wiki with over 100,000 pages of descriptions of, of just where records were and what kinds of records were available. And some of those descriptions are quite long. And that's many, many times 100,000 pages of documents telling you where all the records in the world are located. So, and they don't, and they're not exhaustive. Um, um, there's not everything is not in the research wiki. It's just that there's enough in there to get started and to have uh, a, a good basis for making a, a, a good effort. And usually what I'll do is I'll show somebody a long list of records like on the cat on the on the catalog and uh, they'll sit there and look at it for a minute and they'll say, am I supposed to look through all those records? And I'll say, well, no, you look through the records that were created in the time frame when your when your ancestor you're looking for lived, and the places where he lived or she lived. And they go, oh, you mean all those? Yeah, that's what I mean, and that's what we do. And then they get into it and they find the, some record, and they open it up and it says it has uh, um, eight thousand images, and they say, well, how am I supposed to? find this and i said well they're you got to figure out how they're organized are they chronological are they by are they alphabetically oriented are they um in there haphazardly just because that's the way they were collected or how is it that you get through to those records and the answer may very well be you go through them page by page looking for your individual classic example of that kind of record or are New England town records. They're chronological, but they're not subject separated. So if you're looking for a birth record, you have to look through the time period when the birth may have occurred page by page because they didn't separate out that from the real estate records and the tax records and the minutes of the meetings and all of those things. Uh, they're, they're all just in there in the town records. And so you need to just uh, work through them from front to back. And so the, the answer to this is, even though when you think you've gone through every conceivable record there is, um, there's always more. I used to give this kind of example when people would be come up to me and say, give me that long explanation about how they looked everywhere for their grandfather. And I would say, well, let's see, did you search in the New York Public Library? And they go, what has that got to do with anything? My grandfather wasn't in New York. And I say, well, New York Public Library is one of the largest repositories for genealogical information in the world. So if you've looked everywhere, you must have looked in the New York Public Library. And they went, well, I don't think so. But to get the point, the point is that <clears throat> no matter how thorough you think you are, no matter how many records you think you have looked at, that there's just more than you can conceive. There's there's just billions of records and you never know when there's records might have information about your family your individual and your person that's really what keeps us going as genealogists that they know i always say this that i like genealogy because it's hard it's challenging and it and i otherwise i would get bored and not be interested in it if it's too simple i'm through i i don't have enough it doesn't have enough to keep my attention. But so far, I've never even come to the very, so far right now, I have such a long list of things that I need to learn that I can't even get enough time to get to what I need to learn. I'm too busy doing what I already know, but I also am so painfully aware 
that there are so many other things out there that I didn't that I couldn't learn. This past uh, couple of weeks, in the past month, uh, I began to realize that uh, at one point in time I had learned how to do Danish records, and I have Danish ancestors. But all the stuff about I learned early on has been changed by uh, the new availability of all these records that are now available from countries like Denmark and Sweden. And so here I am back learning how to do Danish and Swedish research and uh, getting back into translating the headings on the documents and, and understanding how to do house censuses and all the things that need to be done in, uh, in these various countries. And so uh, there's never a time that I can simply say, I'm comfortable, I really haven't learned, I've learned everything, now I know how to do everything. Because uh, every time that happens, I have a new challenge, I have a new set of records. And just recently, for example, um, uh, I uh, have used uh, some tool online tools for a long time. I'm very familiar with Photoshop. I'm familiar with another program called Lightroom from Adobe, all of the Adobe programs and, and programs like that that I've been using from before they even started. But now they've changed all those programs. And I've just learned in the last couple of weeks that I need to sit down and go through and learn how to use all those programs again. Um, that I tried to get into Photoshop the other day and uh, found out that they had moved everything around, that nothing worked, and they had all these new tools. And I had no idea what any of them did or how to, how to do something that I thought was quite simple in the program and now i realize that i have to sit down and watch a bunch of tutorials in, to learn how to do photoshop again so it's the same way with genealogy because every time i look at a new set of records every time someone asks me a question that i don't know the answer to i have to go out there and figure out uh, what it is i need to know to answer that particular question and uh, one of the things you do learn over that period of time is how to learn and how to apply uh, research uh, to finding information that you know has to be out there. That it's always the goal. The goal is that you know it has to be there. Why? Because you're looking for it. But uh, usually what happens is we end up looking in the, in the wrong places. And so learning what I said at the beginning is learning location is so important because we need to come back and center ourselves on uh, finding the records that we're looking for. Okay, so let's kind of jump out here. Um, one of the things that we have is instituted at the Family History Library is a virtual family history help. Um, from any computer that is connected to the internet that has access to online services like Zoom. Um, you can click on this button on the family, BYU Family History Library and have direct connect through a Zoom meeting with uh, the BYU Family History Library. It's limited to time, so we've recently changed the hours. It has limited hours um, during breaks and semesters and education week and things like that. But uh, because we're on the academic schedule. So uh, when you click, it'll tell you we're open from 12 noon to 8 p.m. in the afternoons, evenings, uh, Monday through Thursday, and from 8 to 6 on, on I mean, noon to 6 on uh, a Friday. So you click and you're talking to us. You could ask to talk to me. You could ask to talk to anybody in the library. You could just say, can somebody help me with if you look at that, what on that page and look below that, it'll say uh, special uh, help people, people with special um, uh, skills, and that will give you a list of all the different languages that people can help you with uh, in, the, in the library. So you're not left out there on your own. There's uh, there's one-on-one -on -one help out there, people who can uh, sit down with you and talk you through uh, problems and explain how things work. So this is a, this is a great uh, tool and it's a great opportunity. And, and we always tell people you already might have valuable records in your house, meaning in your uh, immediate family and your and your extended family. 
um, much of what I've spent during doing during the past uh, 40 years of doing genealogy, more or less, is that um, you can, what you can do, is, the more you do, the more records you find. And my first encounter was when I ended up uh, obtaining records that my great grand one of my great grandmothers had had created over a 30 year period of time uh, about her lines and her ancestors and it took me uh, many many years to get through all of those records that she had created and extract the information verify and use the information and that's was basically a lot of the of the information that I had to get excuse me to get started in uh, in doing genealogical research at a serious level, because I had these original letters, I had all of these uh, family group records and other kinds of records that she had created, and I needed to verify that information. So I needed to find uh, out what what sources. Now, when she was doing genealogy back in the early uh, 1900s, from around 1920 to 1940, um, in that range, um, she or 50, she was, um, she didn't have the advantages that we have. And she was relying mainly on letter writing and on uh, visits to the family history library because she stayed, she lived in, in uh, Salt Lake City, right downtown. So you never know if you have some of these valuable records around until you start asking, until you start making it known that you are the person who will take those records off their hands, that they don't have to store them in their basement or attic any longer. So here's my suggestion. Sit down with familysearch.org because A, it's free. B, it's a very good web. It's a very good place to start. And it's uh, got a lot of records. And start working on an online, online family tree. And immediately, if you understand the concept of location, and you understand that there are a way to find those records on family search, then you'll have to learn how to use family search. And that's part of the process that you could learn through the videos that we have on the BYU uh, Family History uh, Library's YouTube channel, or on the Family History Guide, or some of the other resources we have out there that will teach you how to do um, uh, how to work with the family uh, the familysearch.org website and once you become comfortable with that i would suggest you start learning how to use ancestry and my heritage and find my past if you have uh, primarily any british uh, great britain uh, ancestors so when you're into that then you're basically at the point of having uh, the being to uh, work so carefully examine every record hint and learn about the suggested records. Now, all of these programs have record hints. They tell you, uh, give you suggestions about records. Those are suggestions, and you need to validate uh, those suggestions and ask, where did they come from? And are they applicable? Are they really my person that they've found? Is this John Smith my John Smith, or is this one of the 200 million John Smiths out there? So dream big and work hard. Learning all you need to know is not necessarily, it's not necessarily fun in the world's definition of fun, but it is rewarding. And I'll tell you what, it's a lot easier to, to do all of your work and work hard and learn than it is. And, and I enjoy learning more than anything else. And that's, that's kind of the necessary component. Uh, and so if you're, if you're out there and you have it, the the incentive is that the more you learn and the more you get involved, the, the more intensely interesting and intensely um, fundamentally satisfying it is to do genealogy. It's something that fulfills a, a necessary part of your existence when you get into it to the point where you understand what you're really doing is relating to people's lives. You're learning about the difficulties and hardships that they faced. Okay. Well, sorry about the mechanical difficulties at the beginning of this that um, you probably won't know about if you are watching it. Uh, but uh, uh, thanks for watching and uh, keep learning.
All right, we'll go ahead and close. Thank you so okay. much for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on November 10th with Olivia Jewell. She will be giving a presentation entitled Essential Tools for the Hobbyist Genealogist. A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.